All right. Um, hello again. Uh, so yeah, I think we're it's like 203. I think we can get started. Um, so once again, hi everybody. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your afternoon to learn to code some music with me, Avi. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm one of the founders of Flatiron School. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess to get started, let me give you guys a little bit of a rundown of what we want to do. Um, so first, I was going to tell you guys a little bit about me, um, because it's always awkward doing these webinars if you guys don't know me at all. Um, and then just a little bit about the Flatiron School. And then I wanted to kind of, um, you know, change our perspective of how, about how we think about code, because, you know, you're probably familiar with code in terms of like building apps, and we're about to build songs with or music with code. And uh, I think there's something to be said about that. Um, and then uh, we're actually going to start playing with something called Sonic Pi and another Ruby library called Banjo and try to program Shake It Off by my good friend Taylor Swift. Um, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Um, during the webinar, if you guys have any questions, um, especially about the school and stuff, I don't know if we'll be able to answer the coding questions during this, um, but certainly if you have questions about the school or about me or about Sonic Pi, um, we can answer it. And then also if you tweet at me, at Avi Flumbaum or at Flatiron School, um, we'll definitely be able to follow up with you. Um, and so yeah, I guess with that, we'll get started. Hi, I'm Avi. Um, so uh, I started the Flatiron School around four years ago. Um, I've been a programmer for like, I mean professionally for 15 years. I started learning how to code when I was 11. Um, and then throughout high school, I was working for a bunch of companies in the city. Um, and then when I was in college, I got recruited by a hedge fund, um, and I dropped out of college, and I was a programmer there for four years. And then I started my first company called Designer Pages um, that I ran for four years, and I wrote a software patent while I was there, which was pretty fun, um, if laborious. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, uh, I've taught people like Carly Kloss and Rebecca Minkoff how to program. Um, I've spoken at Martha Stewart events and a ton of events. I like to fly planes on my free time, which is not that much when I'm not programming. And I guess sometimes I'm programming so much that I need two computers. Um, but yeah, that's a little about me. Uh, I really, really love, I mean, I, I, I love programming. And I guess when I started teaching it, it was kind of like just for fun. Um, and then I got super into sharing my passion and like my approach to this craft and how I taught myself it with students. And that kind of snowballed into the Flatiron School. Um, so the Flatiron School, we teach people how to program um, both online and in person. Um, we are very like outcome centric. So we, you know, we love people that are trying to learn how to code to kind of dip their feet in the water. Um, but we really focus on people that are trying to change careers and change their lives through this medium. Um, so we're, you know, we're not casual about how we teach programming. We take it super seriously because we're trying to get people jobs and we make that promise to someone that we're going to change their life through code. We just take that really seriously. So, you know, we publish every year these job outcomes um, to, to kind of show people transparently how we're doing as a school and how our students are succeeding in their careers. Um, and yeah, that's kind of uh, how, where, how we got started and a little bit of context about the school. And uh, yeah, I just kind of want to jump into telling you about how I feel about programming and how it relates to music. Two things I really love. So first, programming. It's awesome. Uh, we just freaking love it here. Um, and I think that, you know, when you're learning how to code, or especially if you're not technical and you don't have like a programming background or a technical background, a lot of times people experience programming as this like very mechanical and inorganic craft where it's about these like ideas like data structures and conditionals and arrays and methods and variable scope and encapsulation. <laughs> Excuse me. To the point where programming almost feels like if you have to be, you know, to be good on it, to be good at it, you have to like have been born in the matrix or be half a machine. Um, and throughout my life, I've always experienced code as a way more creative endeavor, as really a medium with which I can express any idea, whether it's, you know, predicting outcomes in a lawsuit, helping architects and interior designers find better building products or collaborating, um, you know, or teaching chemistry and especially music through code. So that programming to me is not really about like um, building apps, but rather it's really just a medium with which to express an idea or to model the phenomenon in the world around you. <laughs> so uh, to give you guys some context, because I'm not really the first person to think that, um, and uh, I kind of love sharing the story and the narrative of programming. Um, so, you know, on one level, I think the idea of like programmable machines started with this guy, Charles Babbage, 
um, in like the turn of the 19th century, in like 1800 or so. He basically invents something called the difference engine, which is a really big um, calculator. It's the first really machine that could solve a math equation. And this is what it looks like. And the way it would work is that you would represent the variables in the equation as weights in this machine. And then you would turn that giant crank that would unbalance the machine. And in order to rebalance it, you'd have to add weights to it. And you'd be adding weights in proportion to the variable in the equation you were trying to solve. So it was a really big machine. It was really cool. And it got Otta Lovelace uh, really excited. So Otta Lovelace is a daughter of Lord Byron. Lord Byron is kind of a romantic poet. Um, and her mom didn't want her to go into like creative writing and poetry because she kind of hated Lord Byron and he was kind of crazy. So she pushes Otta into STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. And Otta starts reading about Babbage's um, difference engine and gets this idea like that's a really cool machine, but the difference is that that machine does one thing and one thing only. And she kind of conceives of something that she calls the analytical engine. And she starts writing these letters to Babbage, trying to explain how his machine is great. But what if we could build a machine that could build other machines so that we could program? Um, and, you know, this is one of my favorite things. This is from a letter of hers. And I think this is like obviously relate directly relates to what we're going about to do. Because Otto Lovelace kind of predicts that, you know, if we could build a machine that we could instruct on how to do things, um, what if we could instruct the machine on how, you know, um, uh, harmonies or, or music works. And she says, supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitch sounds and the science of harmony and musical composition were susceptible to such expressions and adaptations, the analytical engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Which is awesome, because she said that like in 1830, um, which is like 200 years ago, um, and she, you know, she got that totally right, and that like she predicted what electronic music and our ability to make computers or make machines that can create sound. Um, and again, like, you know, you, you always hear about learning how to program so that you can like get a job or build apps and, you know, change the world. And I think that's great. I think those are awesome reasons to learn how to program. But I think one thing we forget is that programming is really a, a medium of expression. It's instructional. It's just giving instructions. And the same way that sheet music is an instructions for how to play a song, we can write code that describes how to play a song too. So with that, um, let's, uh, you know, start programming and have a lot of fun. So um, the library we're going to use um, for the majority of this is called Sonic Pi. And you can download it at sonicpi.com if you haven't already. Um, but also, you know, in general, I would say that if you're trying to follow along in like real time, we're going to move pretty fast. Um, and we're recording this and you'll be able to access this video later. Um, so don't worry about like trying to pair it or type out every single thing I type out. Um, but rather just kind of enjoy the experience and think about the concepts and maybe try along at home. So this is Sonic Pi. It's written by an awesome programmer named Sam Aaron, who's at the University of Cambridge. Um, it's an open source project. And his kind of idea was to try to make learning how to program a little more palatable by allowing students to express ideas in music and not ideas in code. So instead of having to build like a, a small Uber clone or a Kickstarter clone, um, you can instead build songs, um, and I really like that. Um, so this is a great website. This is where you can download Sonic Pi. And I just kind of want to show you guys a quick demo of the power of Sonic Pi um, in terms of a library. Um, so this is going to be a poor demo of the power of Sonic Pi, but this is a Sonic Pi command called play, and I'm passing it the tone of 60, which is kind of a magic number. We don't really know what that means, but let's listen to what happens when I run this program. And we get a little beep, and that's kind of cool. Um, and, you know, given how simple that sound is, uh, you'd imagine that it might be very hard to compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music. But um, let me show you uh, a really cool blog post that, um, or blog series I was reading as I kind of thought of this. So first, um, this is a, a French programmer who uh, basically likes Daft Punk a lot, and uh, I hope you all like Daft Punk because they are – awesome at the techno and house music, which I happen to love. <coughs> I guess, hmm, excuse me, I'm also coming down with a little bit of a cold, so I might cough a little bit. Thank you, Nicole. Um, but uh, I also used to DJ, or I still DJ, um, so I'm really into electronic music and house music and techno, and I learned on vinyl and CD DJs, and I can use Ableton and Tractor, so 
the idea of like composing music with software was something that like I've been doing for a while. Um, and uh, this is a really cool blog series where he basically takes a really complex Daft Punk song called Aerodynamic and in a series of blog posts explains how he programs that um, via Sonic Pi. Um, and I thought we'd actually just really quickly watch this YouTube video because it's pretty awesome um, where he uh, takes this. This is Sonic Pi. He's got a cool black theme on it. Um, but he programs this entire techno track um, that's very complex. And let's listen to how it sounds and what the code is um, because this is what we're going to do, but like mini version. Okay. Awesome video and this blog post series is really great on a lot of levels um, but that's kind of the power of like the elaborate um, and complex music that you can program with Sonic Pi and with code in general um, one thing I really love about this blog series is that he's taking kind of these ideas in music and breaking them down into code so like you know over here he's kind of describing that this track really has five different sections and you know has a bunch of different sounds to it and that you know, how he basically reverse engineers the Daft Punk track from like a waveform to like a visualizer to basically be able to program it. He has to first break the track down um, and, you know, set like all the different sounds and things like that. So that's a very complex track. Um, we're going to build something simpler um, in that, you know, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift is kind of a little bit of a simpler track. Um, but this blog series is really awesome. And then even within Sonic Pi, you know, there are all these tutorials, right? So like, here's your first beep, and we use kind of the, the, the default play method, and then hit run, and there we go. We just played a, using the synthesizer of a beep, which is why it sounded like beep, and then the note we played was 70, which, you know, we're kind of more familiar with like colloquial notes, like an A or a G, um, things like that. Um, but, you know, then there are all these other kind of arguments that you can pass to these, right? So just first, in terms of mechanics, because I also want to try to teach you guys a little bit about programming, um, let's uh, do this. Um, I'm going to make it really, really soft. Okay, so first, play is a method. And um, let me actually jump into my terminal uh, so that we can also learn some Ruby, where what a method is is basically like a discrete piece of functionality that we want to be able to repeat as often as we want. So like, you know, on one level, if I say puts hello world, um, so first by what I just did was I moved into my terminal. Um, and if you're at Windows, you're going to have a little bit of a problem trying to use a terminal. But uh, the terminal is basically like um, my operating system, but from a command line or text interface. And then what I did was I loaded IRB, which stands for Interactive Ruby. And Interactive Ruby allows me to type in basically commands to Ruby and it will follow them. So if I say puts hello world, it prints hello world. If I say one plus one, it will interpret that line of code and give me back two. So it's like Ruby in a nutshell, in general. And then we have this idea, like imagine if I want to say hello world 10 times. So I could literally say puts hello world, puts hello world. And that's kind of really verbose and, you know, um, kind of 
just boring. So what we'd rather do is build like a method called say hello 10 times. And I'm using the def keyword over here to build this little machine. And then in here, I can basically puts hello world and then puts hello world and do this once. I'm only gonna do it three times. So our method's gonna lie to us because I'm already a little annoyed about typing things out manually. But now I've built a little machine. Uh, I built the machine, but it didn't actually do anything yet. So now when you build a method, what you kind of do is you need to evoke it. You need to actually run it. And the way I can run it is through the name of the method. So we call this line where I said def. Def is a Ruby keyword. And then I gave it a string or a, a bare word called say hello 10 times. And now whenever I, I use that word, this word now means these three lines of code. So when I press enter, we're going to actually see it print out say hello three times. Um, and then if I do it again, it'll do it again and again and again. So what Sonic Pi is giving us is a method called play. Um, and the Sonic Pi library is known as a DSL. Um, this is, by the way, the, the hashtag makes a comment, so this is not part of my program. But DSL is something we use a lot in programming. It's called a domain-specific language, where we basically use the core Ruby language to build up another set of verbs and vernacular and, and, and semantics that allow you to do something specific. So, like, if I was building a web app or, like, you know, Uber, the idea of playing a note doesn't make any sense. But in Sonic Pi, what the library is giving us are these terms that mean something to Sonic Pi, and these methods are actually built in Ruby. So play is a method in Ruby, and these are arguments. Arguments are basically like kind of like adverbs. So like if you think of a method as run, you might want to describe how fast you're running. So I might say like run fast or run slow, and that word slow or fast become arguments. Oh my God. I'm sorry about that, guys. Let me just turn on Do Not Disturb. Um, okay, so these are arguments. So the first argument over here that I'm passing to the play method is basically what tone to play. The second argument is called a named argument, um, where I'm basically passing it how loud I want it to play. So now if you could even hear that, it was way softer. And now if I change that to 0 0.5, it'll be louder. And if I change that to 1, it'll be even louder. Oh my god, and if I change it to 2, it's going to be super loud. Okay, so like that's kind of the idea of a method. It's that it's a configurable, a configurable machine that you build in code that you can change the way it runs and the way it works upon every evocation. Okay, so that's kind of step one of Sonic Pi is just understanding that we call that the main method that we're going to use to play music is this play command or this play method. And then you're going to pass it either an integer, which is just a fancy word for a number, that describes the tone. Or you can pass it what's called a symbol. And I can say, I want to play, this is just a symbol, which just basically means like a word. Um, and it will convert the symbol of an A note in the first key or the first A note on a piano, um, which I think is going to be like a very low A, like low, it's all in the bottom of the piano. Um, and now let's hear that. Yes, I was right. It is a very low A sound. Now if I go to like A6, it should be like a very high a sound, right? Oh my god. Whew, that was a, a rough sound. But that's kind of the idea of this play method, that we could describe both the, the note and the octave or key that we want it to play at, okay? Um, so with that, uh, the next thing we have to realize about Sonic Pi is the following problem. So also, let me just change the amp because that was really loud. Um, so amp, by the way, is just like the amplification, how loud it is. So I'm going to make this uh, A5, uh, 0.5. And then if I play like a B, the first octave, so it should be like a high sound, right? Let's actually uh, listen. That's our high sound, and this is going to be our, our low B note. Okay? Um, so you expect to hear, when I hit run now, you'd expect to hear two different notes. First the A sound, and then the B sound. But what you're about to find out is that it's kind of like Sonic Pi is kind of like a piano where you can actually press two keys at once to make a chord. So instead of hearing two separate notes played in sequence, we're actually going to hear these two notes played together. Right? So if you want to create a sequence, you have to use another Ruby command. 
That's called sleep. And you can pass sleep, which is another method, and this is a Ruby method, not part of Sonic Pi. <coughs> Excuse me. To basically slow the script down. So if I say play in A6, it's going to play that, and then it's going to stop for a whole beat, and then it's going to play the B sound. Right? And then over here, you can kind of see the log, um, and you can tell, you can see that what time it's playing things at. And time, I always think about in terms of beats. And then you can also see that it's, it played a synthesizer of a beep at the note of 93. So that in terms of tone, A6 converts to 93. Then we have amplitude and things like that. Now we know how to kind of play notes in sequences. Okay? Um, and like, you know, these tutorials down here kind of explain all that. And in fact, this tutorial, switching synths, might be really nice because we learn about a new method called use synth that can basically change the sound we're using, right? And there's a whole bunch of different synths over here. So let's actually change the synthesizer that we're using to generate these sounds to use <coughs> synth. And I tend to, I mean, there's a lot of them in here. You can kind of see like a dull bell, a growl, a hoover, whatever that is. But I tend to think that piano is the best to compose with. Maybe it was because when I was a kid, I played the piano. So let's hear how the same script of instructions of these two notes sounds with a piano. Awesome. Pretty cool. Playing music. <coughs> so now we want to start doing, now that we know how to play some basic notes and to delay them or sequence them over a graph of time using the sleep command, um, we need to start figuring out what are the notes in Shake It Off. Um, and for that, what I basically did was I downloaded what's known as a ticktail or a piano tail, um, which is a MIDI file that describes all of the notes programmably into a program that called GarageBand. So uh, if you're on a Mac, GarageBand is basically like a, a music composition tool, and you get like what's called a virtual instrument. So like you can see over here, I'm pressing these keys and it's generating those sounds. And by the way, GarageBand is really similar to Sonic Pi in the sense that Sonic Pi is a, a, an IDE or an integrated development environment for writing music through code. GarageBand is actually a user interface or a graphical user interface for creating music. But here's the kicker. GarageBand is also just a piece of software, which means behind the scenes of GarageBand is just what? Programming, right? So the fact that I can press on this key and get a sound is no different than the fact that I can write the word play and get a sound, right? These are equivalent ideas. One of them is just done through a graphical user interface with all these bells and whistles and graphics and buttons and things I can click on, which is really nice. But I can also just say play. And if you're anything like me, this actually makes way more sense. Learning this text interface makes way more sense than learning this crazy interface. <coughs> okay. So... Um, I broke out the two hands of, uh, of, if I was playing this on a piano, um, the two hands, I'd want to use my left hand to play the melody, my right hand to play the mel uh, or opposite actually, my left hand to play the beat, and my right hand to play the melody, and you can kind of see that in these tails, um, and I always think about like, um, you know, uh, what was that like game where you, like Garage, Garage Hero or Music Hero? Where you had to like play the notes, I don't know, Guitar Hero, Guitar Hero, right. I always think about Guitar Hero because like if I focus in on this ticktail, you can kind of see the notes you want it to play, right? So this is the first note in, uh, well actually let's go to the, the, the melody. This is the first note in Shake It Off. It happens like after a few beats and that note over there is a G3 with a velocity of 100. And that's what it sounds like, right? And let me actually just, uh, I'm going to delete the right hand. So let's just hear the melody of Shake It Off really quick. Right? So that's kind of what we want to program. Okay, cool. So what we want to figure out to do is just like, let's just get the first bar, right? Um, can I zoom out over here? Oh, beautiful. Okay, what we kind of want to do is just get maybe like these few notes playing and see what they sound like and see how that works. 
Um, but actually, I think it'll be easier to actually if we start with um, the rhythm. So like, uh, let's actually reverse what we're gonna do. What I think we wanna start is uh, basically getting these sounds, because they're a little more like sequential. Um, right? So yeah, let's just start there. Right, we wanna recreate those first, like, I don't know, how many notes is that? One, and then there's three, that's four, and then eight, and then, uh, what is that, six? So yeah, we wanna get those first like 14 notes playing in Sonic Pi. And really here, we've already kind of reverse engineered the song. So we can kind of just look at these notes and we see that that's an A1. We're gonna kind of ignore velocity, um, but we're gonna have to think about how long we wanna play this note because each of these columns over here is kind of like a beat. So we might wanna release this note after like one or two beats. And then in fact, another thing we have to do is we need to set the tempo of this track at all because I think the tempo over here is gonna be a little slow in terms of when you think about like what sleeping for one beat means. You know, if the track is 60 beats per minute, sleeping for one beat is one second. But if the track is at 120 beats per minute, then sleeping for one beat is actually half a second. So this is kind of like a relative argument. So what we're gonna do is say use tempo. Is that, I think that's, uh oh, one second. I have a scratch pad because, oh, use BPM, okay. So use BPM, which is basically saying we're setting the speed of the track in general. I'm going to set it to 160. And now immediately, when I hit play on our old little um, music over here, it should be way faster. Or not play anything at all. Um, okay, so it's telling me uh, syntax error, unexpected integer, expecting content. And basically what's going on here, <coughs> you see how I said use BPM and I put a symbol there or a colon? This is not a number, and this method, use BPM, is expecting a number, right? And it says unexpected integer because it didn't get an integer. So, by the way, in programming, we have bugs. And, uh, you know, I always try to tell beginners that are learning to code and that are new to programming that, like, the nature of your program is broken. Like, as people or as humans, we're really uncomfortable with things being broken. Um, and you always feel like it's your fault that it's broken. But I think that the nature of every program is that it's broken until you fix it. So for instance, like this whole program is broken right now because this does not sound like shake it off. But if it sounded like shake it off, then we wouldn't be programming, we'd be done. Um, so like get used to errors, get used to things being broken. It's not that big of a deal. In fact, it's kind of what's fun, right? So now that the BPM is so much faster, that sleep is so much more relative and the whole track sounds or these two notes play really faster. Right, if I change this to like a really slow beats PM, like a 40, right, you can see how that's affecting the way that we're interpreting our music, right? So we're going to go to 160, because I think that's the right BPM for Taylor Swift's Shake It Off. Um, and then, uh, yeah, let's play our first note. So we want to play an A1. So I'll say play A1. Um, and let's just do that for now. Okay, so that's equivalent to this, right? Pretty, pretty similar sounding. I mean, GarageBand probably has a little bit of a better virtual instrument for the piano. We're using a Steinway Grand Piano here, um, whereas here I have no idea what kind of piano we're using. But, you know, I'm not like pitch perfect, but that sounds pretty good, okay? Um, and then our next note is going to be, uh, let's say, two A2s in a row. Um, so here's where we have to start using sleep because I want to actually like sleep for like half a beat to kind of separate these notes apart. Um, and let's just try sleep 0 0.5, which is half a beat. And then I want to play uh, A2 and A2. And after kind of every single uh, note, I'm always going to sleep for half a beat. Otherwise, they'll play on top of each other. And let's see what it sounds like now. Oops. So now we should be at like these three notes. Okay, so that's a little too fast. I'm gonna slow down the BPMs to 150. Okay. Let's compare. 
And this is kind of also what's fun about programming. Like even if you're building a web app, you know, you'd have these like designs that you're trying to like, you know, make a recreate. So like uh, this was like, um, oh, actually, I'll show you guys another one here. So study groups, right? So like this would be if I was programming a web app like Learn, I would need to – this is a new feature we're about to launch called study groups. And this is, this is my PSD that my designer gave me. So these are the graphic design of it. But over here, this is what I would need to build. And I have a target that I'm trying to build against. So like when you're building a web app or an iPhone app, your fidelity or the medium of which you're trying to model or create are generally graphics. With When you're programming music, what I'm trying to recreate is basically oh, – I hate this looping thing. Go away. Cool. Um, what I'm really trying to recreate is these sounds. And I want to kind of go fluidly between <coughs> what I know to be true, right? So it goes dun 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 and to what I've programmed, but not this one. Back to Sonic Pi. Yeah, let's get that other note in. So over here, we can see that these, this note, the next A2, is separated from the last one by like a full, I would say that's two beats at least. So I'm gonna say that after this A2, I actually wanna sleep for two beats, and then I'm gonna play another A2. And now I should have like these four notes recreated, okay? Cool. That sounds a little slow. Like, yeah, that's a little off. Let's try 1.5. Still off. Let's try one. There we go. That's it. Right. So let's listen to it again. So now we've got these first four notes recreated. Cool. Awesome. That's great. Let's get these next three in. And now we're also going to, by the way, see a pattern. Do you see how like one, two? And then one, two. It's the same. It's the same repetition, just missing that first note. So, like you know, in theory, and we're gonna get to methods in a second. But that first note is the A one. But then these are kind of repeated. So now, let's see. I want to sleep not for. Okay, so we said one. So there's gonna be a two second sleep after that third note. And now I want to replay this exact sequence again. And now I should have basically this first, I don't know, measure um, of Shake It Off. So let's listen to it again in, in, in GarageBand. Okay, cool. So now... All right, and there we go. We are like slowly rebuilding the song. Um, this is actually working pretty well. That this one still that, that, that feels a little slow. I think it's one seven five. Let's try that. Still a little slow. There we go. That sounds about right. Let's listen to it one more time. And by the way, like um, I don't know if I'm like totally on beat or, but um, I think I am. I like to think I'm like kind of rhythmically inclined. So let's listen. It's still a little slow, but it's good enough. Okay? Um, and this is kind of like our first uh, few notes. And now let's actually go back and let's try to get the other hand playing in sequence with this and see how that goes. So this is going to be really hard or hard-ish um, because you can see that like the way the song works is that this starts – Right, and like they kind of overlap, right? So that we have to get these notes playing kind of in advance. And I guess the way I want to do this is the first thing I'd want to do is just program these separately in the same way that we program these ones, right? So I'm just going to comment this out um, and then just focus on like if I, I'll leave my note, this is my rhythm. And now what I really want to do is kind of get like that melody going, right, of like these notes over here. It's one, two, three, four, five notes, and they sound like this. Right? Oh, let's get rid of this. That way we don't get the rhythm confused with it. So. Okay. Um, also, I cannot sing at all, so I'm sorry if you, you know, that was like awful, but 
I was just reminding myself what I'm trying to sound like. Okay. <laughs> so we want to play a D4 followed by uh, a B3 followed by an A3. So I'm just going to say play D4. And then I'm just going to sleep for 0 0.5 because these look like the same size, two bars, which we said was like a 0.5 sleep. And then we had, what note was that? Uh, B3. And then we have A3. And then we have uh, a G3. G3. Okay. And then we have uh, 0 0.5. And then now, this is interesting, because this is a B3, but we have to hold it um, for like a whole like two seconds, right? Like you hear that? So Sonic Pi actually makes that pretty easy, um, in that there's another argument that we can send to play, much like amplitude, called release. So when I play our B3, I want to release it. Uh, after two seconds. And let's just listen to the difference between a, a note that's released immediately versus a note that's two seconds. So here's our B3. Right? Boom. And then let's get release two out of there. Right? I don't know, that's a really subtle like difference, but here's one way we could do it is like let's make this an extreme release over 20. Right? You kind of hear that play out. Like, boom as opposed to when we release it instantly. And I, I don't know, my piano teacher is probably upset at me, but I think it's like staccato or something like that, when you release it like instantly, but I don't know. Um, okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna release this after two. And now let's uh, listen to our melody, right? So it starts with the D4, B3, A3, G3, and then our B3 with a release two. So let's listen to it in, in GarageBand and kind of get a sense of what we're going for. So, again, I apologize for my voice. Perfect. So now, we got to figure out a way to do is kind of like splice these two ideas together in the right offset. And by the way, this is where, like, it might take a second. Um, so let's think about what's going on here. We have, when do they come in contact with each other? So it's kind of like we want to get that D3 and that first rhythm one playing together, right? So I'm gonna copy all of my rhythm section and let's see what we can do. Um, okay, so I know that this is the right order, right? And that we said, right as we're playing this B3, and I'll go back to GarageBand, and I wish I could line up both of these together, but apparently I cannot because I'm switching between them. Um, right? I wish I could like merge these. Can I? No, that's not a thing. I just sort of wrote them. Okay. Um, but like I can see if I zoom in that this note starts where that note starts. So, you know, normally where we'd have a sleep in between every note, I kind of want this to happen actually where we're going to start with our melody and then right as that last two second hold B3 note plays in our melody, we're going to start our rhythm, right? And then, you know, basically at the end of that rhythm section, it's going to kind of continue. But this should basically sound, there should be a good amount of fidelity between these two. Um, oops, what am I doing? I wanted to zoom. Okay, cool. Right, so it goes... Da -na 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 -na. And then as it goes up, it's going to start the ba dum bum ba bum bum So. Right, and that's where we should be at. We should be at basically up until this measure should be programmed. And it should sound pretty much like that. Let's try it out. I mean, come on. That's awesome. Okay? I did not think it was going to sound that good, so I'm pretty excited. I want to listen to it again. Okay, let's continue. 
Um, <clears throat> and I guess like this feels good to me. Like the way we're kind of going, like one stanza, one part of our music at a time. Um, you know, I, I don't like repeating myself, and I, I want to start using like some of the more advanced Sonic Pi methods. But given that we're all beginners and this is going pretty well, I, I'm pretty happy just kind of sticking to this for now um, and seeing kind of how far we can go without really abstracting too much away into like methods or loops or things like that, right? So now let's go back to our garage band. And we said we're right over here, right? So the next note that I want to play is this one, which is there. <laughs> I believe, right? And it's actually, if I look at this pattern, it's actually a repetition of that same like melody, right? These one, two, three, four, you know, it's besides, yeah, it's just this starting note. Let's see what that is. So that's a D3. So I'm going to say um, at the end of this over here, we're going to sleep for 0 0.5, and now we're going to start our next phrase, and we're going to say we want to play D3, and there we play D3, and then we actually repeat the D4, B3, uh, A3 thing. So, one second, what was that note again? What's that? Mouse over, tell me. D4, okay. So, somewhere in my Sonic Pi, I should have it. Okay, cool, I want to take these and just repeat them, because I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. So now we should be all the way at this point. Um, but then this, OK, we're going to take out this last note, because that's we know that's not going to be right. Because when, when that, actually, you know, let's leave it in. OK, we're going to go for broke. So on that D3 where we have that two second hold, we also want to start playing the next hand, which is going to start with this note in sequence, which is, I think, a C2. Okay, cool. So let's do play C2. And then after C2, we want to sleep for 0.5. And then we want to play these two notes in sequence, so two C3s. And in between every note, we're going to sleep for 0 0.5, and then another C3. And then we're going to have to press play because we've been programming too much. So that's those are those two C3s, right? And they should be playing for the entirety of that two-second hold. Um, that's that first one. So, okay, the second C3 should not be played overlaid with this one. Um, let's see how it sounds. I don't know. So C2, C3, C3. So we should be at, by the way, just to be clear, we're at this moment in time in the music. Let's see how, see how we sound. Cool. That is pretty good. Right? We're at this measure, which is like, uh, I think like 4, 2 or something like that. Um, can I put a marker? Is that a thing? Eh, no. Oh, also, our BPM is exactly 148, so let's just change that. It'll sound a little more accurate. Cool. Progress. I know it doesn't sound like it, but I promise. That's progress. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's hear it out in GarageBand, and we'll know kind of how close we are. So we're very close. We said that we're over here, basically, right? We programmed up till that. So let's continue, because it's kind of easy. Like, there's just, you know, a few more notes on this hand that we want to play. So we're going to sleep for a full second after that last note, um, which is basically going to be this full beat. And then we're going to play, what note is that? Another C3. And then, let's see, after that C3, it looks like a two-second pause, two beats. Um, and then we play two C3s in quick succession. So 
will sleep at zero point five. Okay, so now we should be at that one, and then after that one we play another C3, and it takes us all the way. Hmm. Okay, so those are those two. And then after this one, we want to sleep for one beat, and then just one last C3. Okay, so let's see how, we, how this sounds now, and then we'll compare it to our garage band. Cool, that's good. Um, I can hear like the melody coming in. Um, that's what we need to do next, is basically get this melody in. We programmed that note, that was a C3 after one, so okay. So now what we need to figure out is we need to start our melody next. So how big of a gap? That looks like one note until we start our melody again. So now we're back to this note up here. Ooh, it looks like we missed a note. No, okay, great. So now we want to get this guy back in, which is a D4. Pretty sure we played this already. Yeah, so it's just this kind of like scale from a D4 <coughs> to our B3, to our A3, to our G3. So it's this scale over here, right? Now let's see what happens now. bad. So that takes care of those notes. So now we just want actually to repeat this scale. So basically these three notes without the D4 to get a little further along. But these happen, you can see that these three happen in sequence with, um, two with three rhythm notes. So let's get these three in there, right? So G1. Okay, so it was uh, okay, G3. So over here, we want to play a G1, which is this one. And then we want to play in sequence with that two G2s in the next two. And we're basically like, like splicing the hands together. And I'll show you guys another way I approached building this, but I actually like this way way better. So this is a whole thing. Sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> I just want to, uh, like, I am blowing, like, my own mind here because I did not think this was going to sound this good, I promise. Like, I've been playing with it. Just I want to show you. This is what I'd come up with after talking to a bunch of Sonic Pi people. Um, it was basically something, like, that uses a lot of these, like, really advanced Sonic Pi macros. In fact, let me just grab one of them because this is really what I had originally um, come up with as close as I could get. Um, before I started breaking it down the way I'm breaking it down with you guys, I'm using this idea of like actually having two loops playing in, in sequence um, using a lot of really cool Sonic Pi magic where R stands for like a release note. These are the other notes and I'm playing a timed pattern. And so that's that's one way I got it working earlier using a lot of really cool Sonic Pi methods and a list of notes and like a repetition. But I actually really like this. This feels more natural. It's a lot more work, but it's way easier to control the details. And the timing is definitely more accurate. Bum, bum. Okay, let's get that, let's get that bump bump. And then I think we're gonna probably wrap it up. So where we're at is I believe we got these three notes, and now we just need this, like, boom, boom. Hold on one second. Where, where did we end? We ended, the last note we played was a G2, which I believe is going to be this note over here. Right. And then we want to sleep a beat. So a whole beat, not just a five. And then we're going to play another G2. And then... Um, that occurs alone, and then 
up here, we have, what node is that? 6, 4. Um, so these two. And that's going to be like for 4, E3 for 4 release. When does that occur in sequence to that? It's going to be after uh, a two-second sleep. And then what we get over here, that's a, a E3 for four. So play an E3 for release of four. And then we're going to sleep for half a second. And then play it one octave down. D3, same thing. Okay, I think this is where we're going to end, but let's see how this sounds. Hey, cool. Awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, that is kind of a really quick intro to Sonic Pi. And just playing, you know, I don't know, music with code. Um, again, there's like tremendously complex things you can do with Sonic Pi. Just to show you again, like, because it's so freaking cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're not also into like data structures and algorithms and linked lists and depth first search and all the other kind of things you have been told that, you know, computer science is about, just know you can also just like program music. And that is still programming despite what anyone might tell you. Um, so, yeah, with that, um, Let's uh, just kind of wrap it up a little bit, um, and I'll answer any questions you guys have, if you have any ones. So yeah, so first, um, you guys can go to learn.co and start learning, and you know we have a free intro to Ruby track that's super fun and really engaging, and I'm on the platform, we've got a really active Slack channel with a whole bunch of awesome programmers and people learning how to program. Um, we're going to send you guys an email with some special offers, and you guys can tweet at me, and I'd love to hear what you guys thought about this, and if it you know, change your perspective about what programming is and the kinds of things you can do and like the thought process and creativity behind it. I'd really love to hear that because that's what I'm in this for. Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. So what are the questions, Nicole? Hmm. Also by everyone, Nicole is sitting next to me and she organized all this <laughs> and came up with the idea because she heard me play the music once with the programming and she's awesome. She's great. So thank you, Nicole. Welcome. We have a question about learn.co yeah. and what it's like. Sure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I can kind of kind of walk you guys through really quickly what Learn is like. Um, so Learn, we built this at Flatiron, um, and uh, it's basically the way we've been teaching uh, our even our in-person classes for like two years now. Um, and we just kind of like six months ago basically released it to the world uh, because we really love our curriculum and the way we teach and our pedagogy. And the in-person class is great, but the problem is that it costs like fifteen grand, and uh, you know it just um, you have to move to New York, you have to quit your job. We wanted to see if we could increase the access to our sort of education um, through uh, program uh, through an online platform. Um, and like you know, you basically have like a whole bunch of curriculum. I'm just going to pull up like something that I can solve really quickly for you. Um, building an acid hash lab. So this is kind of what a lab looks like, and you can see it kind of explains um, you know what the rules are and what you need to do. And then you can click on this open button, and what's going to do is it's going to open up your terminal, which is like the programmer's workbench, which is what all programmers use in the whole planet. And then it pops up your text editor. Now you're ready to actually program. <coughs> all of our all of our curriculum is test driven, so we'll give you a failing test, and it's your job to make it pass. So it's going to give me a whole bunch of errors, and if I start reading these tests, it'll tell me what I need to do to make it work. So the first things I need to do is that. My, in my first challenge method, I must set a variable epic tragedy equal to a hash with the keys of the family names and empty hashes. So when I make first challenges in here, my epic tragedy should be filled with keys of Montagues and Capulets. So you like to mix like other creative ideas like Romeo and Juliet, if you are familiar with um, Shakespeare. And if you're not, read some Shakespeare. It's good stuff, I promise. Um, and the values, there should just be empty hashes. Um, and this would basically be like programming to spec, sort of the way we were programming to spec when we were building the Taylor Swift song. So there's my first challenge, and now I can run learn, fail, fast, and it's going to run only my tests and give me one failure at a time as opposed to all of them. 
And you can kind of see that my first challenge one was solved, and now I'd have my second challenge. And eventually, you'd actually be able to get this all working, and I'm just going to cheat really quick because it's more fun for me, not for you. You guys need to learn. I built this lab, so you know, don't worry. Um, I promise I could do it. Oh, no, it's so much code. Okay, scratch that. That is way too much code to copy. Huh. Okay, well, anyway, eventually, you then submit it, and I'm about to submit some broken code. But long story short, Learn kind of knows uh, your progress and tells you what's going on. Also, if you ever have a question on Learn, if you're stuck, you can just click on there and ask a question of the whole community, and then you progress your curriculum. That's kind of how Learn works. It's really a ton of a ton of curriculum. We do info sessions on this all the time. Um, like tomorrow, we do one. <laughs> um, so if you guys want to know, learn more about Learn or Flatiron School and how we teach, uh, you know, I'm super happy to do that. Uh, I tend to love programming. Whenever I'm invited to these webinars, we end up spending way too much time actually building things and not, you know, marketing to you, which Nicole <laughs> might be a little upset about me for. Um, but I had a lot more fun kind of figuring this out. That's so cool. We, we made that with our minds. Last um, question. Yeah. For someone who knows very little about programming or code, mm -hmm. how difficult is it to learn? Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I think learning how to program is not easy. Um, it's hard. Um, but it's also not impossible. It's really just like discipline and like like understanding that, you know, I find like a lot of beginners, like after their fifth day learning how to program, I get really, really frustrated. And they're like, why aren't I good at this yet? And it's like, because you've only been doing it for five days. I've been doing this for like 15 years. Um, so it's hard. But I think with a supportive community and a really structured uh, curriculum and like consistent, repeated effort, uh, everyone can learn this. And I think that's what was really great about Learn is that because it's online, it's because it's self-paced, but because there's such an active community and you get to hang out with me a lot, like you get to do it at your own pace. You don't have to do it all in 12 weeks. You don't have to quit your job. It's just a way better version. It's a way more accessible and slower and like, like less, I don't know. It's a less trial by fire way to learn how to code because you can move at your own pace. Um, and I think that the students on Learn are like amazing. Um, so yeah, it's not easy, but it's not impossible. And I think the hard things in life are worth doing. Like, you know, you do something hard and you achieve something great. So yeah, that's about it. Um, I don't know. That was super fun. I had way more fun doing this than I thought I was going to. I was, I was like really nervous before this. I don't know if you guys <laughs> could tell, but I was not sure it was going to work that well. Um, I thought we were going to make something really crappy sounding, but it sounds pretty cool. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh yeah. So also Nicole reminded me to have you check your email because I think you guys all got like a little special offer. But anyway. All right. That's it for today. Um, you guys were awesome. Um, I hope you had fun. I had a great time. So thank you. And uh, yeah, we're gonna be probably be doing some more of these in the future, uh, especially now that I had so much fun. Um, all right. That's and it. We'll for answer us. all the questions they asked. <laughs> we didn't get to. We're gonna answer all the questions you asked that we didn't get to. Um, and also my email address is uh avi at learn.co so you can always just email me um it's hard for me to get back to everybody but if you email me i will try to respond or forward it to my team and they will respond because they're awesome too all right have a great wednesday everybody thank you so much again for taking the time to talk to me um and uh yeah that's it cool bye